Thank you, Mike, very much. We hail from the same province back here. I haven't seen him for many years. Um, I feel right at home here, not just because it's a Jesuit institution, but judging from the fact that nobody's sitting in the front rows, I, I take it you're Catholic, so it's uh, <laughs> right at home. Um, you know, there's a common vision that I think joins us uh, together uh, as students here and faculty and people of faith uh, and uh, perhaps my work with gang members. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time and presses on to fulfillment and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But the purpose of this, uh, this Jesuit Heritage Week and of your education is not to just you know, wait with your arms uh, crossed and tapping your feet and staring at your watch. You want to make things happen. And I want to suggest what I think that is, uh, the thing that connects uh, your study and perhaps what I do. Uh, Martin Luther King said, what he said of church could well be said of your time here at St. Peter's, that it's not the place you come to, it's the place you go from. And that's always kind of foremost in your mind and in your education. I want to suggest that the common goal here is a, the creation of a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. Uh, Mother Teresa, I think, uh, got this correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world, of course, is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that we belong? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? A kinship is a funny thing, you, you blink and you miss it, you don't want to. Uh, the homies are always teaching me things, you know. Uh, uh, I run the largest gang intervention program in the United States of America, so I, I suspect I probably know more gang members than anybody on the planet. And the homies are good teaching me things endlessly. Education, of course, ends in the graveyard. Uh, and so you're always trying to learn things, you know. But they were teaching me, probably in the past year, how to text. This is uh, my latest thing. Uh, quite, I just, just sat by myself in your theater right now, uh, endlessly texting. It's about the right time. Homies are awake, more or less the ones who are supposed to be in my office. So they're asking all sorts of things. And so I'm, I'm quite adept at it, you know, OMG and LOL and BTW. And, and there's a new one. OHN, which, which stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> I've been using that one quite a bit lately. So I'm in a car with two homies, Manuel and Poncho, and we're driving to a place called Palm Desert, which is about two and a half hours from Los Angeles. We're going to give a talk to a big, huge high school. And um, yeah, as we're driving, Emmanuel's an older guy, you know, when I say older, late 20s, been to prison, in recovery, heavily tattooed. And, and he's sitting there, I can hear that kind of zzz, you know, that sound where he's just got a text in. And I turned over and he starts to laugh. I said, what is it? No, oh, it's dumb. Um, no, seriously, well, it's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, Snoopy is one of his coworkers in the clocking room. So we have 427 employees, so that's a big task. You have to clock everybody in, in and out, lunch and breakfast, out lunch and uh, clocking in and out the whole day. And uh, we just left him 15 minutes before. I said, well, what's it say? Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest bottle in America. You gotta come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I almost swerved into oncoming traffic, you know, and, 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 and we were just dying laughing. And then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies, they're rivals. In fact, they used to shoot bullets at each other. It's about imagining that there is no us and them, that there's just us. You know, a lot of times the focus is peace. We want peace. No kinship, no peace. I don't care how you slice it. Or we want justice. No kinship, no justice. It won't ever happen. No matter how hard you focus on justice, it won't happen until we have a sense of kinship. And so uh, to that end and that hope and that goal and that aspiration, which is really God's longing for all of us. In fact, in the gospel it says that you may be one as the Father and I are one. So to that end, what are we called to do? We go from this place to do what? To stand with those on the margins and to stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. You stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. You stand even with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and 
you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. That's the goal. Uh, in a lot of our Jesuit institutions, we talk about men and women for others, uh, which of course is magnificent. Jesus, of course, was one with others. There was a kinship that was total. It wasn't about service provider, service recipient. Service is, of course, the first step. It's the hallway that leads you to the ballroom. But the ballroom is kinship. If kinship was our goal, I suspect we would no longer be promoting justice. We would be celebrating it. A kinship is a funny thing. You know, I, uh, uh, you want to be attentive to it all the time. I, I, I'm in 25 different detention facilities as a priest. It's one of the reasons why I think Homeboy Industries has gotten so many uh, gang members to go come to our place. Uh, comparable programs in the country often say, how do you get gang members to go to your office? And well, that's not a problem we have. I invite you to go there. A lot of college groups spend their spring breaks or summer breaks and we do a lot of immersion stuff, so come and visit. But I hand out uh, my, my card uh, to a thousand gang members a month, probably. Uh, I'm in 25 different detention facilities, juvenile halls, jails, probation camps, um, youth authority facilities. Uh, almost all the gathered are gang members. And after mass, I was given the same infomercial. I say, call me when you get out. Don't delay. I won't know where you are, but you now know where I am, so you give me a call and we'll find you a job. We'll take your tattoos off for free. We'll we have mental health counseling. You name it, we do it. We have a school. But don't delay. And uh, I remember one day I'm sitting in my office and the 17-year-old uh, gang member named Louis uh, appears and he says, here I am. I, I just got out yesterday. And you are the very first person I came to see. And never in my life had I seen more hickeys on a human being than on this guy Louis. It was unbelievable. His neck was covered. His cheeks were covered, and Mr. Guinness of the world's records might want to talk to this guy. I looked at Louie and I said, Louie, I have a feeling I was your second stop. <laughs> and suddenly there was kinship so quickly, we just fell out of our chairs laughing so hard. Homeboy Industries was born in the housing projects of Pico Gardens and Liesel Village, which was the largest uh, grouping of public housing west of the city. Uh, I was pastor of the poorest parish uh, in the city of Los Angeles named Dolores Mission, located right in the middle of these projects. We had eight gangs, half of them at war with the other half. I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988. I buried my 168th um, young person killed because of gang violence uh, three months ago. Not all from that community, of course, but because I know so many gang members, I sadly am often asked to perform that task. So we did a lot of things. First thing we did was we opened a school because there were so many junior high age kids who had been given the boot from their homeschool. Nobody wanted them. There was no place for them. So we started a school right on church property, which brought gang members to the church, which jostled our notion of church, which is typically hermetically sealed good people and bad people out. Well, that kind of created a disconnect for the people. Um, and, but pretty soon they, they would ask themselves, what would Jesus do? And they determined that this was exactly what Jesus would do, would be put the welcome mat out. So this brought gang members to the church and, and they kept saying over and over again, if only we had jobs. And so we went to all the factories that surrounded the housing projects, but trying to locate felony friendly employers, and that was a challenge. Such a challenge that we couldn't find enough for the demand. So we started our own businesses in 1992. Homeboy Bakery was born. Enemy rival gang members baking bread together. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market of downtown LA. And then once we had two businesses, we came up with the highfalutin uh, Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this. Uh, 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 <clears throat> Tattoo removal was, was born because of a guy named Frank. Uh, this guy came in right out of prison and, uh, you know, and pardon my French, but tattooed on his forehead was fuck the world. It filled the entire space of his forehead. And he says, you know, I'm having a hard time finding a job. You know, <laughs> um, you know, maybe we can put our heads together on this one, you know. And, um, and so 
all I was imagining was, do you want fries with that? And women clutching their kids and running out of the store. So I hired him, because he was going to hire this guy, and he worked at our bakery. And, and then I you know, found a doctor who, you know, once every three months, would dedicate an hour of his laser uh, machine to remove tattoos. And now we have uh, uh, two laser machines, a dedicated clinic, a whole clinic dedicated to it. 12 doctors, 4,000 laser treatments a year. There's no place on the planet that removes more tattoos than we do. So if you're starting to regret your peacock power tattoo that you have, <laughs> see me afterwards, I'll give you my card. Uh, and it was all born because of Frank. It's funny, I, I hadn't seen him in years, actually. And, uh, and he came to the office about two months ago. And now he's a security guard at a movie studio. And uh, the angriest moment of his life has been erased from his forehead. And you don't see a trace of it. And of course, everybody is a whole lot more than the dumbest thing they ever did. So and now we're the largest gang intervention program in the US of A. We have 12,000 folks, gang members walk through our doors every uh, year, uh, hailing from 800 different gangs. There are 1,100 gangs in LA County with 86,000 gang members, so it's a pretty daunting reality. So we have free tattoo removal, uh, school, uh, every imaginable curricular thing from anger management to parenting to, uh, uh, you know, we do with grief and loss. And we have five businesses, Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silk Screen, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff, um, Homeboy uh, Maintenance, and Homegirl Cafe, place dedicated just to the female uh, gang population, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order, so I invite you. It's gourmet and they cater. Uh, my favorite story at the moment uh, is a homegirl cafe story. Um, about a month ago, uh, Diane Keaton, the Oscar-winning actress, movie star, uh, Annie Hall, Godfather, she shows up for lunch one day. She had never been to homegirl cafe. And um, she's there with a regular who brought her there. And our waitress uh, that day was Glenda. Glenda's, you know, been there, done that, homegirl, gang member, been in prison. And uh, she's taking her order. And uh, Glenda doesn't know who Diane Keaton is. So Diane Keaton is saying, well, what, are, what do you recommend? And Glenda names off her three favorite plates, you know. And uh, so Diane Keaton says, well, I'll take that. And and then something dawns on Glenda. Wait a minute, where? You look so familiar to me. I feel like I've seen you somewhere. You know, I feel like we know each other. And Diane Keaton sort of deflects at it. She goes, oh gosh, I suppose I have one of those faces that people say that they know. No, I know what it is. We were locked up together. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's about kinship. Somehow, um, you know, Diane Keaton feeling connected to Glenda, her, her waitress. Uh, I guess I, I never felt a sense of kinship more keenly in my own life than in the last few years of struggle with health. I had leukemia and went through chemotherapy and I'm feeling pretty good at the moment. Here I am in Jersey City. And, um, um, or as the homies always say, I hear your cancer's in intermission. And I said, yes, yeah, so apparently it stepped out to the lobby to buy some popcorn. So may the line be long. So, but this was announced to the world on the front page of the Sunday LA Times that I had cancer. So um, homies came out of the woodwork. I got you know voicemail messages. I remember a little girl named Gina. Uh, she was very sweet. She goes, now it's our turn to take care of you. Uh, big, huge homie named Grumpy. I'm sitting behind my desk, and he stands in front of me. He's, he's like six foot five, and heavily tattooed, and apparently God had forgotten to give him a neck, you know, and he, he's standing there, big tears in his eyes, and he says, what do I have that you need? You know, meaning organs. Um, really happy to tell him I didn't need any of his organs. <laughs> it was the thought that counted. One of my favorites was a 15-year-old gang member, a little knucklehead, who came into the office, and uh, um, he had just sort of heard, even though I was sort of in mid-chemo at that point, I'd still go to the office no matter how bad I felt rather be there than any place. And so I'm sitting behind my desk and he plunks himself down in the chair. He looks positively stricken. I hear you have leukemia. I said, yeah, I do. And there's this awkward silence. 
My cat had leukemia. Yeah. She died. Like, oh, gosh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry to hear. I'm really glad you stopped by. It just picked me right up there. One of my favorites was a homie named a local who called from jail to collect. And uh, he had just read this in the LA Times. And he says, hey, what's up with this leukemia anyway? I said, well, it's cancer. You know, it's in the blood. The doctor says my white count's too high. <laughs> and the doctors, they don't be knowing nothing. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, hello, of course your white counts high. <laughs> you white. <laughs> so I get a lot of uh, second opinions. <laughs> you know, um, the truth about gains uh, is that it's all about a lethal absence of hope. Nobody in this room and nobody in this country has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. It's never happened. Never. Hopeful kids don't join gangs. Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery, and misery loves company. No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something, always. And that's important. If our diagnosis is bad, how in the Wild West can our treatment plan be good? It can't be. So, what works? Well, you choose to be uh, what the child psychologist Alice Miller calls enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love return kids to themselves. You don't put the bar up and ask anybody to measure up. Uh, you show up and you hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth. You say, here's your truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you stand back in the great privileged place there is in watching people become that truth, inhabiting that truth. And no bullet can pierce it, and no four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's really that huge. But the task, of course, always is um, dismantling messages of shame and disgrace. And uh, they're always quite present. Uh, Marcus Borg, uh, the scripture scholar, always says that the principal suffering of the poor is shame and disgrace. <coughs> and, and so that's um, what you have to do. You have to reach in. And you have to tell a different version of their what they think their truth is. I remember a homie named Filiberto. Uh, he's the saddest guy I've ever met. It's just uh, hard for him to find much joy in his life. Well, especially when he first came to work for me. Um, I remember once uh, uh, my older brother and his wife came to visit our third location. And uh, they were uh, kind of checking out and giving the tour. And they left. And Fili came up to me and he said, uh, Hey, what's your brother do for a living? I said, well, he's a principal at a middle school. And, and your cuñada, your sister-in-law, I said, well, um, she's a nurse at an intensive care unit at a hospital in San Diego. And Phoebe shakes his head with great sadness. And he says, damn, G, everybody in your family is somebody. Which meant, I guess, that he felt he was nobody. And likewise, uh, everybody in his family, nobody. So one day he came into my office and he was, uh, it just went on and on about this flika. A flika is a photograph. He goes, I found this flika of me. I, I guess I was maybe 10 years old, little tiny thing, little black and white. I can't believe it's me, I keep staring at it. I said, well, that's interesting. It's in kind of a non sequitur. Three days later, he brings the subject up again. Yeah, you know, I still keep looking at that flika. I guess it's, my parents took a picture of me for immigration purposes or something, but I can't believe it's me. I said, yeah, you know, you mentioned that the other day, and I'm thinking, this is the oddest conversation. Then I cut to two days later, he uh, comes into my office, and, and he throws the said photograph on my uh, desk. And there he is, little 10-year-old Filiberto, with a big shock of hair, you know, a typical Latino gang members to shave their head, so his head was shaved at that moment. And uh, so I don't know what to say. I go, gosh, you got hair. I don't know what to say. And I don't know, is he giving me this photograph or should I give it back? And, and the only way to find out is to extend it back to him, and I do. And he doesn't take it. He goes, do you think there's any way we can make it big? And I said, sure. 
So that day I go to the mall and I go to the camera store and I walk in and the guy says, can I help you, sir? I said, yeah, make it big. And he says, it's too small to make big. I said, I don't know what you're going to do. You have to make this photograph larger than it is. And the guy worked his magic. I don't know how he did it. It got to be about four by four, a little bit green and a little bit green. And this is not a story about a photograph. It's a story about the self made to feel too small from having been bombarded with messages of shame and disgrace. And how is it not the job description of everybody in this room to somehow reach in and dismantle that untruth and replace it with the God's honest truth? I remember as a kid, uh, there was sort of a mantra for me that came by way of a Christmas carol called O Holy Night. And in it they had that one line, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Yeah, it's about Jesus. Yeah, it's about Christmas. How is it not the job description of everyone in this room? It's about appearing. And the soul feels its worth. Exactly what God had in mind. I remember only years, years ago, everybody called him Bandit. And he was particularly well named. He was into his gang, into his gang banging, he was into selling crack cocaine, <laughs> into running up to cars and making sales. And uh, and no matter what I said, I'd be on my bike in the middle of the night in the projects and, and I'd ask Bandit, you know, you want some help to not do this anymore? No, I'm okay. Thanks. Very polite. Until one day, 15 years ago, he shows up in my office. Couldn't believe he was there. And I said, yes, he milagro that you've shown up here today. He goes, I'm tired of being tired. So I walk him over to a job developer. We have four of them in our office. We try to locate employment outside of the whole point industry. And as luck would have it, they find him a job, entry level, unskilled, warehouse, your kind of basic first job. And now cut to 15 years later, cut to today, a bandit runs that factory. He's the, the, the foreman or the supervisor of the factory. He's married, owns his own home, has three kids. And I hadn't heard from him for a long time. And one Friday afternoon, he calls me kind of panicky and breathless. He says, gee, you got to bless my daughter. Oh, my God. ¿Qué pasó? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine. My oldest, Jessica, she's going to college. But I'm scared for her because she's just a little tiny thing and... You know, she's going to move away from home, and I don't know. Could you give her like a bendición before she leaves? I said, sure. Look, tomorrow's Saturday at 1 o'clock, I have baptism. Why don't you, you know, come by at 12.30, and we'll give her a little send-off uh, before she goes. So sure enough, the next day, um, they all show up, abandoned and his wife, with three kids, including little Jessica, little tiny thing. And I said, well, let's put Jessica in front of the altar, and let's all encircle her. And everybody, you know, touch her, put your hands on her head, and touch her arms, everybody connect to her. And, you know, let's close our eyes and, and bow our heads. And, and as the homies would say, I, I do some long ass prayer. I go on and on and on. And somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I'm noticing that we've all become chiones. We're all crying. Everybody's sniffling. Everybody. I don't know why we're crying. Except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone college, except me. Certainly nobody in their families. So, you know, we kind of laugh about how much you do, we wipe our tears, and, and so I look at, at uh, Jessica. So, what are you going to study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. I go, damn, forensic psychology. <laughs> and Bandit chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. <laughs> And Jessica turns and very deadpan looks at her father and does one of these, you know. And he, he gets the joke and he goes, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. So we walk out to the car and we all say goodbye, big abrazos. But Bandit hangs back and I, and I say, Michael, can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. 
a problem. And his eyes filled with tears, and he says, son, it's gay. I'm proud of myself. All my life, people call me a low life, a butta butta nada, good for nothing. I guess I showed him. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth, exactly what God had in mind. And the world, of course, is gonna look at bandit and any efforts to help him. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna deem that effort a waste of our collective time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place in which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And that's the task of everybody in this room, to make those voices heard. I'll tell you one last story, and then I'm going to open it up for your questions, where you will get uh, extra credit if your teachers are here. <laughs> um, about three weeks ago, I got a phone call from this woman who's helping Laura Bush write her memoirs. And she wanted to pick my brain about a time when Laura Bush came to visit the Homeboy Industries. She was traveling around the country and visiting after-school programs and uh, mentoring programs and boys and girls clubs. And we were the only uh, gang intervention program she visited. And uh, we decided to have the visit take place at the Homeboy Silk Street because it was, uh, you know, the easiest place to secure. Homeboy uh, Silk Screen is a huge factory, off, sort of off campus, if you will, not connected to our huge headquarters. Um, biggest business, most successful, 2,500 different customers. Um, thousands of gang members have gone through there, um, being trained. Um, high quality work, reasonably priced. We UPS to Jersey City, so anyway. So um, that was where the visit was going to take place. And, and the day of her visit was unbelievable. It was. Social, social Security, Secret, what do you call them? Uh, Secret Service everywhere, I know it was an SS. And uh, bomb sniffing dogs, and there were sharpshooters on the roof of all the factories surrounding um, Homeboy Silkscreen. There were sharpshooters in the rafters inside the building. I, I don't know what they thought um, the homies were gonna do to this one, but boy were they prepared. And about two weeks before, uh, a very severe looking um, head of the Secret Service detail came to me and said, Father, um, I'm going to need the names of the 50 people, there were only going to be 50 out of all our employees, but the 50 people who are going to shake hands with Mrs. Bush, um, we're going to need names, we're going to need birth dates, we're going to need social security numbers. So we decided to declare undocumented worker day off on exactly that day, uh, so not to get into any kind of trouble. So I type up this list, and uh, oh, you're filming this. Anyway, I type up this list. <laughs> And I hand it to uh, the Secret Service guy. Two days later, he comes to me and he's hemming and hawing. Uh, wow, Father, yeah, I don't know how to tell you. But these people have records, he says to me. You know, like, this news might come as a surprise to me. I said, well, at Homeboy Industries, sort of the idea, you know. I had to negotiate a couple of the homies, but anyway. So, a visit comes, and she's very nice, and everybody feels quite proud that the First Lady of the United States has visited Homeboy Industries. So three months later, I get a phone call from uh, the White House, from the First Lady's office, and one of her staffers calls and says, and, you know, Mrs. Bush is sponsoring a huge national uh, conference called Helping America's <coughs> Youth. It'll be at Howard University in Washington, D.C. She would like you to speak at it. I said, I'd be honored. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Bush would like you to bring three homies with you. Now, whether Laura Bush actually used the H word, I can't be certain. Um, but, uh, and then afterwards she says, uh, after the conference, a select a few will be invited in to have dinner at the White House. Now certainly crooks have resided in this house before, but it may well be the first time gang members have ever stepped foot in the place. So, um, so I picked three homies who work for me, Gus, Gabriel, and, um, and uh, uh, Herbie. And if you were to call Central Casting and say, please send us the most menacing looking gang members, it would be these three, you know, just a mess with the White House a little bit, you know. So, uh, so I'm thinking, God, these guys are going to go to the White House for dinner. They can't exactly wear size 85 waist dickies, you know, we've got to get ourselves some suits. And, and so uh, 
So we went to Men's Warehouse, you have that here? You're gonna like the way you look, I guarantee it. Yeah, that guy was, that guy was nowhere in sight, you know. Uh, but we walk into the Burbank Men's Warehouse, and I swear to you, every single salesperson rushed us at the door as if to say, now how many we help you walk out of our store as quickly as possible? I said, we're gonna be needing three suits. They're having dinner at the White House. And the guy said, yeah, right, okay. So he dispatches them into dressing rooms. And I'm outside kind of looking, you know, um, looking at ties, and our first guy comes out, Gabriel. And he's in a perfectly fitted gray suit. And he's standing in front of a six-sided mirror, staring at himself with his mouth open. He can't believe his eyes. Now, Gabriel's about, at this time, uh, about 25 years old, has three kids, worked for me for a couple of years at that point. He no longer works for me. He's moved on to a higher paying job, God love him. And, but at the time, he was our tour guide. He was our main tour guide. He <clears throat> would greet you at the door, and he'd introduce you to our job developers. And he'd um, hand you goggles so you could watch tattoos being removed on the premises. And then uh, he'd walk you into the bakery and hand you a hairnet so you could watch uh, enemy rival gang members bake bread together. Gave great tours. Loved giving tours. He was the best at it. Kind of a menacing looking character, covered with tattoos. His neck was blackened with the name of his gang and his head and face. And he's already undergone 38 laser treatments. They're very painful. Uh, he needs just like 96 more, and then he'll be, he'll be just good to go. So um, he has the most pure, innocent heart of anybody you could ever meet, though the packaging might suggest otherwise. The day won't ever come when I have more courage, or am more noble, or am closer to God than this guy Gabriel. So I walk up to him and he's still staring at the guy in the suit. And I tap him on the shoulder. Are you okay? He goes, damn, gee, I'm already pinching myself. Like, you can't imagine he's in the suit. Can't imagine he's headed to the White House. Well, I purchased the tickets months before. But a week before we leave, I don't know what compelled me, I called Gabriel in and I said, hey, did you ask permission of your parole officer to go to Washington? He said, oh, of course. I said, good, you know, he said, yeah, she said no. I go, Gabriel, when were you gonna get around to telling me that she had said no? He goes, actually, I wasn't gonna tell you, I was afraid you wouldn't let me go. I go, son, we gotta do this the right way. What's her number? So he's sitting there and I call this woman. And I give her the whole spiel, White House, dinner, conference, first lady. Nope, high control. High control parole, some of you in the criminal justice class will know that it's kind of a hypervigilance, you know, shorter leash, you're not going anywhere. I said, could I talk to, you know, like your supervisor? So the second guy gets on and I give my spiel. He says, absolutely not, high control. I said, could I talk to somebody who's like a notch above you? And, I get to the notch person and, and uh, he says, this guy's going nowhere at all. He's a high control parole. They all seem to be having a bad case of, and Gabriel, who did you exactly think you were that you get to go to the White House for dinner? So furious, mad uh, emails and faxes from the Department of Justice, from the White House, from the First Lady's office, and in what may well be the singular accomplishment of the Bush administration, we get permission <laughs> to go to, uh, uh, to the White House. We were going to go anyway, but permission is nice. I, I don't, you know, so. so anyway, on the day of the trip, it's mishap after mishap. Uh, the homies are always late, of course, so that puts us in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic heading to LAX. And, and, for, and to nobody in particular, it, it, did all of you remember to bring your IDs? Silence. A lone voice from the back seat. <laughs> we have to drive back and get Gus's ID. It's unbelievable. Then we discover on Thursday, which is the day of the suits, the day of the conference, the day of the White House, uh, we had arrived on Tuesday, that apparently poor old Gabriel, uh, when he was running to my car in the early morning darkness with a bag over one shoulder and his men's warehouse suit uh, over the other, covered in plastic, open at the bottom, and in the movement, the, it, it jostled the pants, apparently, and it slithered off the hanger and it fell, unbeknownst to him, somewhere in the gutter or on the sidewalk, and some homeless guy is liking the way he looks, I guarantee it. 
and I, we stayed at my brother and his wife's house in D.C., and then we could hear Gabriel in the morning yelling, I don't got no pants. <laughs> so my sister-in-law and Jerry rig a pair of my, my brother's pants. Anyway, work. Go to the conference. I give the talk. And they're in their suits. And we walk into the White House, and there are butlers walking the hallways with trays of uh, long-stemmed glasses of white wine, and the homies are snatching those puppies as quickly as they can. And every room has sort of an elegant combo and a little brass quartet. And, um, and then we go to the gold room, which is the place of the food in the most amazing buffet I've ever seen in my life. Absolutely gourmet. I went back like eight times, you know, and rack of lamb. It was just like perfection. Salmon the size of Wisconsin. You know, there were pastas and salads, every imaginable kind of food. And I'm standing there with Gabriel, and they had these white potatoes cut lengthwise with the hole carefully bore out in the middle, stuffed with caviar and a sprig of chive. And uh, Gabriel pops that sucker in his mouth and spits it out into a napkin. This shit tastes nasty, he said. You know? <laughs> and, and apparently the volume of the knob had been misplaced, you know, and uh, it wasn't me or did the Secret Service lunge ever so slightly at exactly that moment. So. Anyway, uh, I told you all that to tell you this. The next day we're flying home, and Gabriel was sort of an innocent in the world, you know. He says, hey, I gotta go to the baño. I said, well, it's at the back of the plane. 45 minutes later, he comes back. Oh, yeah, cabrón, I thought you fell in. Okay, what happened? And he said, oh, oh, I was just talking to that lady back there. And I turn around and I see the flight attendant standing by herself at the back of the plane. I made her cry. I hope that's okay. I said, well, Gabriel, it might depend on what you actually said to her, you know. And, well, you know, she saw my homeboy shirt and she saw my tattoos. I don't know. She asked me a gang of questions. So I gave her a tour of the office. At 34,000 feet, Gabriel walks this woman through the office, introduces her to the job developers, hands her goggles so she can watch tattoos being removed, gives her a hairnet so she can watch bread being baked by enemy gang members. Then I told her last night we made history. For the first time in the history of this country, three gang members walked into the White House. We had dinner there. I told her the food tasted nasty. <laughs> and she cried. I said, well, let me home. What just fact? She just caught a glimpse of you. She saw that you are somebody. She recognized you as the shape of God's heart. People cry sometimes when they see that. And suddenly, kinship so quickly, two souls feeling their worth. Flight attendant came from 34,000 feet, exactly what God had in mind. St. Peter's is not the place you come to, it is the place you go from. And when you stand at the margins, trust me when I tell you, people will say you're wasting your time. But in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And so you make those voices heard. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, you wait for it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, what nationality do you Say it again. What nationality do you um, 
African American, Latino, Korean, Vietnamese, Bloods and Crips. I would say 800 different representatives from 800 different gangs. I suspect it's way higher than that. We actually sat down and studied it about three years ago. My guess is, my bet is that there isn't a gang in LA County whose members haven't visited our place for services. Though it was born in a Latino community, so it, it, it's changed since we're in our, for the last three years we've been in our um, huge, huge headquarters, which is down in uh, near um, Olvera Street in Chinatown. So it's, we always say it's in the heart of the city, representing the heart of the city. Remember, uh, yes, Mike. The question is that kids who come to us are coming from gangs and what's the attitude of the gang in, in the light of this guy sort of defecting, if you will. Well, you know, again, 95% of all gang members want what uh, the homies and homegirls encounter at our place. 5% are really damaged, sociopathic, scary, they probably need a timeout. But 95% of them, uh, you know, want what the homies find at Homeboy Industries. But it's a little bit like, if you can imagine Homeboy as sort of recovery and, and rehabilitation. Uh, and, and so if you have a heroin addict who runs into uh, uh, somebody who they used to shoot up with, but that person went to rehab, you're not gonna find that heroin addict who's currently using, hating on him, you know. They're gonna say, yeah, hey, good for you, nice going. I'm not ready to, to get clean and to be sober, but good for you. They won't hate him for having gotten himself clean. It's, it's the exact same parallel. Uh, to get jumped into, to get initiated into a gang, typically it's you get beat down for 13 seconds and then you're in the gang for life. To get definitively courted out of a gang, you have to. They have to do this at a meeting, which means vast majorities of all the gang members are there, and they all beat you very badly until an ambulance is called. Again, I think I know more gang members than anybody on the planet. I know five gang members who have ever been definitively courted out of a gang. Uh, it's not necessary, you know. You hang up your gloves and you walk away, you disappear. You no longer engage in what we call at homeboy, hanging, banging, or slang. If you work at homeboy, you cannot hang, kick it with the homies, you cannot slang, sell drugs of any kind, you cannot gang bang meaning all that activity ranging from writing on the walls at the low end to shooting at people at the high end and anything in between. Uh, you just have to step away from it. Uh, it. Again, it's akin to an AA meeting where somebody stands up and says, Hi, I'm Greg. I'm an alcoholic. Nobody goes, well, wait a minute, then what are you doing at AA? You know, it's part of identity. It's part of, uh, yeah, that's part of who I am. And I don't drink anymore. But that's part of who I am. I don't have anything to do with my gang anymore. It's really parallel. Our place is not for those who uh, want, uh, excuse me, it's not uh, for those who need help. Lots of folks need it. It's only for those who want it. You have to walk through the front door. What happened to that extra credit I was talking about? Yes. You mean, when you say Department of Justice, you mean parole, probation, yeah. law enforcement, the whole gamut of, yeah. You know, uh, in my old days, I've been doing this now for almost a quarter of a century, the first 10 years were really marked by hate mail, death threats, bomb threats. Um, now when I say that, people think, oh my God, gang members threaten you in that way? Well, of course not, because gang members saw oh boy, have always seen oh boy as a beacon of hope to them whether they're ready to walk towards that light or not. But if the demonizing is complete, and if law enforcement, and probation, and parole, and the criminal justice system demonizes gang members, it's a short hop to demonize me. The friend of our enemy is our enemy, as the Middle Eastern dictum goes. So that's what my first 10 years was about. And now, I would say, Homeboy Industries has been so embraced by the city of LA, um, the chief of police every Tuesday morning, would have his meeting with his uh, top brass every Tuesday morning 
for breakfast at Home Girl Cafe. It was a symbol, you know, but it was a symbol he was willing to make. When previous chiefs had just demonized me as a co-signer on somehow, I don't know how that would be, a co-signer on bad activity and criminality. Crazy. I mean, it's like the, the director of a, a, a drug rehab center. You don't co-sign on drug use. You're there to help people move beyond. Oh, boy, industries like the exit ramp to kind of get off that crazy freeway, you know. And so, uh, truth, smart cops and smart probation officers and smart parole officers get what homeboy is. And the less than smart, truthfully, don't. And that's just the way it is. Yes? How do you get along with ICE? Oh, with ICE? Uh, uh, I haven't had too much contact with them. Yes, ICE. ICE is the Immigration Control uh, Enforcement. Custom, yeah, it's what the MIGRA used to be. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had too much encounter with them, thank goodness, going on the wood. Uh, you know, I mentioned undocumented gang members. Their only crime in terms of that is that they didn't protest enough when they were uh, six months old and in their mother's arms as she crossed the border. You know, that's their crime. And they will be charged with that crime forever. They can't legally work in the country. And that's a crime. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you convince them to move away from the lucrative business of drugs to your business? Or are you paying them that well? Yeah, it's about lucrative business of the drugs. I invite you to read Freakonomics. The only thing he gets right in terms of gains is the part about how much money you make if you sell drugs. You know, it's like $3.50. So there's not much lucrative in there except at the highest, highest levels. But the, the, the regular street people aren't making that kind of money. And it's about the dignity of work, you know? If you work at home in the streets, you've got a reason to get up in the morning, and more importantly, a reason not to gain back the night before. Uh, and if you believe, as we do in our own uh, kind of sense of the Catholic uh, history of social justice, that, that work is dignifying, then you know, we pay better than minimum, but still, I, I want to do one shameless plug. I have a book called Tattoos on the Heart, um, and that's sort of why I'm sort of on this tour all over the place. So I encourage you to, uh, to get it if you can. Um, it's a book I've been trying to write for the last 20 years, and finally did. So um, you're welcome to purchase that somewhere, Amazon or something. Well, there it is right there. Um, you know, I just want to say a uh, funny thing on this, the homies, when, when this arrived, uh, I had these three homies in my office, my senior staff, and they're all former gang members. And, you know, my editor got a bunch of nice people to say nice things about the book. You know, from uh, Richard Rohr to Marion Wright Edelman to Kerry Kennedy and Martin Sheen. And then on the back, Jack Kornfield, who's kind of a, uh, a guru and a wisdom figure and a great man, he says, he uses all these embarrassing adjectives that I'll spare you. But then he, he says later on in the blurb, Father Greg, the Gandhi of the gangs. And so one of the homies, Pasquale, was reading this. He goes, the Gandhi of the gangs. And part of the senior staff, their, part of their job description is taking you down a notch, you know. So the next day, Pasquale, who's a college grad, former gang member, runs our parenting classes. He emails me, here's a blurb for your book. This book is astounding. Father Boyle is the Sarah Palin of the gangs. <laughs> In fact, he can see Mexico from his back porch. Uh, so that'll go on the paperback edition, no doubt. Thank you for letting me plug this. Thank you. And thank you all very much.